All right, let's get started. We're going to talk about GDPR today, which is one of probably the most boringest topics I've ever given a talk on. So I already understand, just to be ahead of it. But uh, one little bit, that's me. It's my name, it's where I work, that's what I do, that's Twitter. I recommend if you have any sort of content filtering or HR department to not load that at work. Um, and actually, I want to go back here real quick, because I want to point out two important things. Notice how the word lawyer or attorney is not in that title whatsoever. <laughs> I'd also like to point out the lack of letters after my name indicating that I have a professional degree indicating I know the law. I am in no way, shape, or form an attorney, a lawyer. I did not go to school for this. I'm a nerd. That said, we're going to get into it because this fortunately has nothing to do with the law. The law is what it is, and there's a lot of people with, that spend a lot of time on that. But what exactly is GDPR? Who here has never heard these four letters in a row? Sounds about right. It's been kind of a big deal lately. And more importantly, why won't this? Oh, there we go. That's what it stands for. Now, none of those words actually mean anything. It is probably one of the most vague things that I've seen for something that's essentially this important. So I'm going to break down. What is it about? Data. Everything about this is about data. Personal data. And that's why. Our data is worth a lot of money. A lot of money. And for years, we've just kind of given it away. All these companies essentially said, trust us. And we did. And it was a terrible idea. I cannot emphasize how bad of an idea this was. Uh, from the time it basically started, all of these services, we just started handing over our data. They asked us for something. We said, sure. We just kept clicking numbers until, I'm sorry, kept clicking buttons until it gave us what we wanted. That's kind of how we were trained to use the internet. At least I was. But I want to look at some numbers about what things are currently. So the first thing. Now, great, 92% of people worry about their online privacy. I can't think of a way to frame this question that someone would say no. I have no idea what this means. Huh? OK. I have no idea how you could phrase this question that someone would say no. So again, this does nothing. Now, the next thing is going to be, oh, connection lost. All right, phone thing's not working. I'll just use this. Now, this is a better one. 31% of company people actually understand how companies use their data. I do this for a living, and I don't really know what they do with all my data. I have a better idea than most, and maybe I just stop paying attention because it's scary. Um, the next thing is going to be, now this is a big one because this is where it applies to us. 74% of people have limited their online activity due to privacy concerns. If you're building anything remotely, a website of any sort, kind, application, what have you, the whole idea is that you want people to use it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be building it. And they're not coming. They're stopping coming because they're worried about something they don't understand. So now the question is, why? Why does all this matter? What's the big deal? All of these companies have one big thing in common. All of them, since 2014, have had a very large data breach. And sorry, let me try and find the numbers here, because this thing is annoying. Um, I apologize. Whoops, there we go. All right. eBay, 145 million people. Target, 110 million people. JP Morgan, 83 million people. Uber, 57 million users and then 600,000 drivers. Anthem, which is a health insurance, you know, health management company, 80 million. Equifax, we remember that one. That's 143 million. And then we have Yahoo, which was the big one, with 3 billion. And now all, you know, users are not the same. Depending on where they pulled that data from is how valuable it may have been. However, how many people in the last year or two have gotten new credit cards in the mail without being told because there may have been a breach? And you have to keep changing your numbers online. Yeah, that, that's why. So users have a very good reason to not trust any of us with this stuff, because we violated that trust, and frankly, we've ruined it. So then in comes the EU. 
Now, the EU has always had more rights given towards users than the United States, which is surprising for many people in the United States. And a lot of this boils down to the users have rights. They have rights that we have not given them in the past. Now, they have the right to be informed, which is essentially you have to tell them what you're doing with the data that you collect. You have to tell them that you are collecting data, even if it's not important. You have to make sure that they opt in, which means you cannot check those boxes anymore for them, period. Now, they have the right to the access to the data. Now, this is one of the bigger ones that you, know, you saw, probably saw some stuff come out. If you have data on me, I have the right to a copy of it at will, at request, in a human readable format. Now, what that means is very vague on purpose because what is readable a lot of times will depend on what the data is. But you, you get it. You have a right to it. And you have the right to be forgotten. Now, this is a fun little story. So. In 2010, I deleted my Facebook account, mainly because I didn't go to a college that had it, so I never really got into it like other people. And then when the first privacy thing came out, I'm like, you know, I don't really use this, and this is just another thing. Got rid of it. A few years later, I was doing, a client, doing some client work, and I needed to check some face. I was checking all the meta tags and all that other sharing stuff. But I had to be logged in. Told my client, hey, I don't, I don't have an account. He's like, just go ahead and use mine. So I go to log in, it pings me like, hey, you've not logged in from this state before. And I'm like, all right, it's going to ask me some questions, whatever. It's like, show them the person's friends. Like, who are these people? I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know this person's friends. So I made a fake account. That was fine. And then a few years later, I needed an account to be able to access um, certain websites and, and some stuff for my dad. And I didn't want to use the fake account because it had a fake name and, and yeah, probably would have pissed people off. So I made a new one. It would not let me use the email address that I had used when I created my first one, 12 years prior. I and this was back in 2007 when they said they would delete it. Like, it didn't say deactivate. It actually said delete. It's not deleted. Um, if you really want to be worried about that, Google um, Facebook shadow profiles. And that's how you can kind of find out stuff. If you pull nothing else from this talk, no any ideas, whatnot, just you need to understand the data that you collect no longer belongs to you. You could argue that it never really did. But it's really important to know that it ain't yours. The best thing you can think of is you're leasing it because it belongs to the user. Now, what does that stuff mean? Why do you care? Why, oh, sorry, why as a developer does any of this stuff care to me? This sounds like marketing, this sounds like analytics, this sounds like, again, stuff that I don't care about. So the first part, I went to this guy's James Lang. Does anybody know who this is? OK. He's in prison right now. He got 40 months sentenced for, remember the Volkswagen uh, emissions stuff that they got busted for? OK. He is not a CEO. He is not a manager. He is an engineer. He has the same title in his job that I have in my job. He is in jail. He was not even, and this is the important thing uh, that came out, the court even said he was not the mastermind. He still got in trouble, which means that we're not protected simply by saying, I wrote what I was supposed to write, or I just filled the specs. That's not going to fly, which means they're coming, from, you know, like the reason I bring this up is not to point this guy out. I'm sure he didn't really think he was doing anything wrong. And I'm sure he didn't decide to cheat the emission systems on his own. But he's the one that took it, which means we're the ones that have to deal with this. I don't think the, the CEO for VW even got fined. So maybe I have your attention, hopefully, possibly. Now, what do I do about this? And again, why do I care? So the first thing. We have to kind of drill down to what data does this actually talk about? What does this stuff mean? Because it's such a nebulous word, and you can call anything data, especially us. So they talk about its personal data. Now, I want to first point out that the EU defines personal data differently than we do. We just say personally identifiable information. That means one bit of data, you can connect it to one person without any help. You look at my email address, it's my name with a period in the middle. 
That's personal, you know, identifiable. The EU just says personal. That's anything. Not only that, they look at context. They look at aggregation. They look at a whole bunch of stuff. But the first thing's here. OK, racial, ethnic, political. I don't think I have collected any of this data on a website other than maybe political opinions in a comment section. So the first time I see this list, I'm like, again, I still don't care. You know, none of this stuff matters. But then the EU expanded what they meant by that. All right, genetic data. I don't even think I could connect, collect you know, any of that data. Biometrics, a location. Core collects your location when it shows you the upcoming events. Pseudomized data. OK. Mm, online identifiers. That last one. That one. How many of these things are not in the user meta table or the user table? So we're collecting personal data by default. And that's, it's not that you can't collect it, and it's not that you can't have it. It's just we can't just grab it, is really what it boils down to. So this applies to everyone. And now this is a caveat, and I will get into this in more detail, who does business with the EU and what exactly defines doing business. That does not mean doing business with the European Union as a governing body. That means anybody who lives, is a resident of, is vacationing in, is vacationing from the EU. So the, question, the first question I always get with this is, can I just stop selling to people in the EU? Probably not, because you can't automatically identify them. Like, is anybody here a resident, like a citizen of a country in the EU? OK, when I was in Orange County, that, okay, there we go. If you buy something in Michigan from a company in Idaho, GDPR applies. Because he is a, you know, he is a citizen of the EU, whatever country in the EU, obviously. So it applies to everybody, every business, every organization. There's not a cutoff limit. It's like, oh, you have more than x dollars or x numbers, then it applies. No, everybody, blanket. Now, does that mean they're going to treat everybody the same? Of course not. But we don't know how they're going to be. Now, this is a big thing. Now, who's in charge of all this stuff? Who is supposed to be doing this work? Who monitors? Who does all of this? They have no idea. But there's two people that are involved. And the way they define it is data controllers and data processors. Now, the controllers, again, more vague words that don't mean anything. You know, a controller decides what to take in, where it's used, where it's stored, and who else gets it. So think of that as a gatekeeper. Think about that, frankly, most of the time, as us. When you're collecting that data on the website, you are a data controller. Now, a data processor is basically anybody else who touches that data. Google Analytics, uh, abandoned cart software, anything, you know, recurring user, anything that you might be doing with that, that you're handing a SaaS, something like that. Now you're like, which one am I? Very possibly both. You can be both. So you have to start thinking about privacy by design. It's not something you add in later. It's not something you sort of bolt on. It's like you need to start building things with the idea of keeping user privacy first. And that trumps pretty much, I hate that word, but that trumps pretty much every other goal now in terms of data. Now, it's not visual design, but actual data. Privacy first. So you need to know everything, which sounds like a lot. But we're building it, which means you need to know what you're collecting. You need to know where it's going. You need to be able to articulate to someone what you're doing with it. An easy way to think about this, and especially who you're giving it to, because that's on, you know, that becomes your problem sort of as well. You know, if you're thinking about using a data analytics program or anything like that, like if they can't explain how they do it in like two or three sentences, it's probably illegal. For the most part. Now everything again, it sounds like so much work and it's like great, now I have another thing I have to care about. But it's not really that bad. You start with something called a privacy impact statement. Um, Heather Burns is a, um, a policy, legal policy expert over in, uh, over in England. She's been doing a whole bunch of this. She spoke at Word Camp EU about it. You start with figuring out exactly, and this, by the way, is a, this is required. This is a, almost a law thing. You need to figure out what could possibly happen. What could go wrong? 
and you need to have this, that literally needs to be a written down piece of paper, which again, of course, the government wants paper, so. And that needs to be accessible to everybody who works on the project and regulators if they ask for it. So it's one of those things where they ask for it, that's not the time to make it. The time to make it is when you start the project. Because again, when you're doing scope and discovery, you're sort of doing this already. You've just never put it in one place because you're again, what are the scope? What are the specs? What do I need to collect? Because it's for the user. What do I need to do with it? Who's getting it? Like you're already doing most of this. It's just been kind of piecemeal in different parts of your process, most likely. And again, I could give a whole talk on privacy assessment, um, but this is the big thing. They're still evolving. The law's not even done. There's another part coming out. Um, there was a law that came out in 2002. Essentially, they called it the cookie law in the EU. Kind of a misnomer, but that's the easiest way to describe it. That's getting enhanced as well. They just didn't have time to get them both done before the GDPR came out. So there's going to be even more laws and rules about what you're allowed to connect, collect and not collect and what you have to inform people about. Now, they have said whatever they do to that cookie law is going to work within the framework of GDPR that they've already created. So hopefully they won't put out conflicting laws. I'm not holding my breath. But this is a big thing. Ignorance is no longer an excuse. As we saw with the, you know, with the guy from, from BW, he probably said, oh, I was building what I was supposed to. Like, I wasn't aware that it was, you know, again, whether or not he knew what he was doing doesn't matter. You know, we can't be ignorant to what we're doing anymore because we're the ones building it. It's, it's a hard argument to make that you don't know what you've just built. I've made that argument before because sometimes I literally didn't know what I just built. But almost every single time, I know exactly what I did. Maybe I wasn't aware of it. Maybe I didn't think much of it. Because again, when I was building websites, especially when I started doing this 10, 12 years ago, I didn't think about any of this stuff. I barely knew what I was doing. So I'm sure that there was stuff going on that was probably not good for a whole slew of reasons. Um, and what I want to get into, we're going to do a lot of questions because I know there's going to be a bunch, um, is this isn't hard. And more importantly, for us to think, you know, th these laws are coming to the US. California is probably going to enact this soon. I imagine other states, probably like New York, Delaware, or other ones, are going to also enact this. This is essentially going to be the law of the internet, I would say soon. I don't know how soon, but soon. This isn't like that, that we can just ignore it. Because I remember when VAT came out, everyone was super concerned about it. And like, oh, we have to pay all these taxes to these weird companies. Never done that before in my life. And I don't think anyone else, ever since VAT happened, I have not heard another person talk about it. This is different. Like, this is people. Because people get upset. You know, whereas VAT was like accountants and nobody really cared. Um, <laughs> now, again, is there any question other than how can I avoid doing this? Because I, I, in Orange County, I had four questions about how can I just avoid this? And the answer was you can't. So that question I'm just going to answer right away. You can't. So the, um, the data controller, I, when I set the up, I, I got uh, someone from the company to agree to say they were the data controller. And that's like on the privacy page. Okay. And again, some of this is difficult to answer because they haven't enforced it yet. They haven't actually gone, like they've filed against Google and Facebook and Amazon, I think, over in the EU because that's, that's low hanging fruit, let's be honest. Um, so you very well both could be. Like it's not a single entity. Like the whole idea of controller and processor, it's not like you, there's one. Like on the website, there could be multiple data processors depending on what data is being processed. Um, I would not, just by them saying that they're doing it, I don't believe would totally absolve you if something happened. Especially because you built it. You, you know, they may be collecting it, but you built the engine to collect it. So you're, there's some, again, none of this is legal uh, advice, but you might be at least somewhat involved, culpable, whatever the word may be. So, but again, it's one of those, if you know what's going on, then that shouldn't be a question. Because it would be like, yeah, whether they're collecting or uncollecting it, we know exactly what's being collected. That's the more important. Who's doing it? Secondary. What is happening? 
very much primary. You had a question? Yeah, she was asking about as an agency, what is your role in um, drafting privacy policies and, and things of that nature for individual clients? Once it le you know, if you're not managing the site, because like there's plenty of stuff that I've built and I've never looked at again, and there are sites that I've still had my eye on or, or helped work on for years. So those are two very different things. Um, as terms of the privacy policy, in terms of use, that would be on the individual site owner only because their privacy and their terms are going to be based on whatever it is they're doing as a business. Um, there's boilerplate language. I think Core now actually, when you spin up a new site, it gives you a privacy policy page as a draft. So if you spin up a new, sorry, um, if you spin up a new uh, WordPress site with 496 or above it will create a privacy policy draft page as a draft. Like, you know, it makes sample page and like hello world. Well, now there's hello world sample page and privacy policy. And the private, it's a you know, boilerplate language. There's a link in there to help write one. Um, I know yeah, that's gonna, they're going to put more stuff in there. Like they were getting that out before the May deadline for GDPR. So yeah, the terms of, you know, terms of use, privacy policy, that's going to be a lot of stuff based on what the individual company is doing. You can definitely try to give them guidance. I would not veer into the, I'm giving you legal. Um, and because the onus is going to be on them, I'm not sure your attorney would be money well spent for them, unless you're going to just bill that forward to them. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things, you know, as you're building it, make note of everything that you're doing. And that way, because what very well may happen is you give it to the company, the business, they're running it, and their lawyer's like, oh, we need a privacy impact statement. So. Even though you're not the one that has to handle the outcome of that privacy impact statement as the agency, you're probably the only one qualified to write it because they don't know. Like most of the, you know, all, when I ran an agency for a long time, almost none of my clients ever knew what we built. They just knew that it worked. And that was all they wanted. That's why they paid us. So yeah, I would, I would definitely keep, you know, again, keep all the notes of stuff and just be ready to have it and hand it over and be like, hey, this is what we have. This is what I would give to your attorney or whomever else. Now again, are they going to come after the person selling, you know, selling handmade soaps? I don't know. I don't think, I don't believe that's going to be the initial round of stuff they're going to go after. Some of the stuff I have a sneaking suspicion is going to be if somebody complains. And someone could complain about their, G, you know, their GDPR rights on a site that sells handmade soap. Just the same way that they could do it on Amazon. So. The potential is there regardless of the size of your site. So like obscure, being small and obscure isn't necessarily going to protect you. Do you have That's not anonymous. Your IP address tells me where you are. Now, I know that, and Google Analytics is a good example because Google, being that they pissed off the EU for about 15, since the EU started, um, they've never gotten along. And they have pages upon pages about how they're implementing GDPR and what you're supposed to do on your site to, uh, you know, essentially, when you went to the WordCamp Grand Rapids site, remember the little cookie thing you got in the bottom? That's GDPR. That's just the site informing you that they're collecting some data about you. It's Again, this isn't a huge idea. It's, it gets more complicated depending on what you're collecting. But it, other than that, and the analytics, like, that's a weird thing because they're, at that point, they're, you know, you're the controller, they're the processor. You're giving them this information. By putting analytics on your site, you are allowing Google to collect information, which means if they collect something they're not supposed to, that's still on you because you gave them the space. So you can't just throw the biggest, I think the biggest thing that's going to get taken down first are those shady ad networks. The ones that just inject stuff into people, like those are going to get hit first because they're the ones that are collecting user data without the site's permission or the user's permission. That's the, like Google is not going to intentionally break the law. 
you know, bright haven advertising very well may. I don't know if that's a real company. I apologize if it is. Um, actually, you had a question, then I'll come to you. Um, this is going to sound rough, but I would tell her that, I mean, if it needs to be there, and I don't know the policy, I don't know her job, that's not important, get out. Tell her it stays or find another developer, which sounds harsh. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things where the people that are pissed off about this more than anybody else are marketing because they've just been collecting all of this data. They're not even sure what they're going to do with it. I've heard a bunch, and I, I'm going to upset marketing people, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, <laughs> like things like net promoter score, that literally means nothing. What is engagement? <clears throat> no clue. I engage with things all the time. Uh, that's how being a human being works. So, uh, again, it's going to be one of those things where you know, they wanted all this data, they're not going to have it, which means the people that are good at marketing are going to be even better because they actually know how to do the job, and the people that just make reports saying that people engage are probably going to get fired. Um, so if the policy needs, now what I would do is I would have, you know, in this particular case, are you an attorney? Cool. Is the person you got this draft from an attorney? Then I would say, I believe this needs to be there. You need to talk to your attorney because this is important. If their attorney says no, then that's not your problem anymore, unless you still own the site. Because if it's for the client and it's going to be them, and I say ownership as in it's their site, then... And those are usually the worst because they're harder to say no to. But she has a sense of thinking about what she should have on her site, privacy policy based on her profession. Yeah, and some of this, again, like some of the stuff may be. She's taking things off. So that's what bothers me. Yeah, I, w I would, you know, again, it'd be one of those things where, yeah, it's a long term client, but I don't know what culpability you individually would have, but I would definitely make a note of the fact that you said this should be there and they said no. Because yeah, you can't just ask people, will you give up your rights under GDPR to use this site? That's not a valid pop-up. You can't, people can't opt out of GDPR. You can't just ask them, hey, do you care? Yes or no? No? Cool. We'll keep going our thing. Um, yeah, you can't just disregard it. So again, without knowing the profession, yeah, there's probably a lot of nuances to this particular question. So I would, I would suggest at least be like, hey, I think this should be there. You need to talk to your attorney. But document that, save that email, whatever it is. You know, make sure it's in writing that you felt it needed to be there. Just protect yourself. And then actually, I'm going to ask him, and then I'll come to you. There are some, and I know that there's a lot more being built. I've built some stuff. Uh, what you're going to want to start with is essentially do a site audit. And again, when I ran an agency, one of, if we took on a client that already had an existing web property that we had to touch in any sort of way, part of the, part of the contract, part of discovery and scope was doing a full site audit. If they didn't agree to that, we didn't take them on as a client. Because how many times have you taken on a site and then you find out that it's like held together with duct tape and bailing wire and it's, you know, so by doing that site audit, because it's going to be, it can be to a great degree site specific. Um, do that audit. That's when you figure out what you're taking in. Because at least on your, you know, if it's not in the database, you didn't collect it. That's in kind of a, it's not a hard and fast, but it's a pretty good rule to think about it. If I can't see it in the database, I didn't collect it. Then the second thing, and this is where client, where you can, things can get weird, when clients start adding stuff after you've built it. And especially, again, ad networks. Ooh, tracking. I want to see what the heat map looks like. You know, again, all of these things are cool, and there's not necessarily that you can't use them. Like, none of, nothing in GDPR prevents what we do. 
there's a few things like you can't sell the data to somebody else without informing somebody, you know, the user. That's the only new thing technically that might impact you as a developer is that you can't sell somebody's data. I've never sold anybody's data. Apparently it's lucrative, but I've never done it. Uh, so from that perspective, it's like, yeah, figure out what are you collecting? What are you collecting outside of the scope of like a core vanilla, no plugin, no theme WordPress install? If you don't have registered users, you're automatically collecting a lot less data. You know, the moment you're a logged in user, you can see if you look at, you know, uh, Query Monitor or any of the stuff, you'll see all the cookies and everything else that gets collected. You can look in the user and user meta table and see all the stuff that gets you know, collected. If they're not registered users, you're not collecting much on them. And then as part of that site audit, identify any third party that has something on your site. Even if it's not inherently collect, is, because again, those ad networks, so that's where they started getting in trouble, was they would show the ad, but they were scraping all this user data as people came, never telling anybody about it. That's not legal. Um, but you had a very particular question, yeah. So there's a combination, and that's one of the biggest things that I haven't seen a hard and fast rule about how do we get rid of somebody's data, because that's part of it. You have the right to be deleted or erased or forgotten, whatever words they want to use. And that came up, and I think I, I was skipping over it quickly. I have no way of knowing. Uh, with Facebook, I, they clearly didn't delete my email address because they wouldn't let me use it again. And that was 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. Uh, so. And they, as of yet, I have not seen anything that will indicate the proof that it's been deleted. So some of that is still going to be on trust for now until they can figure out how to prove it. Um, when it's things like Google Analytics, you know, by removing Google Analytics, you can, you know, hey, you've removed the, the source, but also, and this is where a lot of it comes down to, I've never looked at analytics on some sites that I've installed it on, ever. I have a site that I've had running for 11 years that had analytics since day one, and I've looked at it twice. I just deleted the analytics and removed it from the site, and I solved the problem now and going forward. Now, I'm aware that you can't do that for all of your sites, for most of your sites probably, uh, but go back into your Google Analytics settings and make sure that you're following along with what they've outlined because, again, Google has pissed off the EU since the EU began they at least make an attempt to not be flagrant about the fact that they don't care about the EU. So I would start there. And then I know that, again, I know Google Analytics, I believe, has a way for delete, deletion requests. It exists. Legally, it has to. Where they bury it now, I couldn't tell you because they keep moving things. But in that audit that I mentioned, that's where you're going to identify what third party even exists. Because then it's like, OK, if it's this company, let me see if they have a thing on their website that says how to delete it, if it's an API call, if it's an email, if it's a phone call. Um, and if they don't have anything, I would possibly look at maybe replacing it. Because <clears throat> if you're using a third party that has not even mentioned GDPR, that's probably a bad sign. Because everybody has mentioned you know, you know those 9,000 emails you got about updated terms of service? Yeah, that's why you got them. GDPR. And I say, yeah, they don't know how they're going to enforce it. I mean, I would specifically, because Google Analytics and a lot of those packages, two people aren't collecting the same data. Like, how I have my analytics configured is probably different than yours, so you may be collecting things at certain places at certain times, and I'm not, and vice versa. So in particular, I would look at the service and what they provide. Some stuff, it could be as simple as, we just throw this information away after 30 days, so there is no data to collect. Or we aggregate it in a way, because again, the EU cares about aggregation whereas the US doesn't. Because the EU understands that 10 people collecting 10 bits of information makes a complete profile of a person, even if those 10 pieces individually don't, which makes sense. We just don't do that because we don't. Um, so yeah, it's really look into the individual pieces that you're allowing on the site and how they are going to approach it. Because again, it depends also what's being collected. Yeah. Yes.
and, and to kind of make that a little bit concise, the idea that as a developer, I used to collect as much data as I possibly could because I figured I might need it later. I didn't know if I was going to use it, but I figured the more I had, the better it would be so I could do something down the road and I would have a complete picture. That's not how to do it anymore. I only collect what I absolutely need and can justify having. Because if I can't justify having that data, I probably don't need it. Uh, i got time for one more question. He had his hand up first. I promise I'll years later, yeah. I'm sorry, hundred hundred drop shippers. Drop shippers, okay. Yeah. That's a great example of how you can be both, by the way. Maybe. And some of this is going to be, like, when was it collected? Because if you collected this data in 2014, I don't think there's a reasonable expectation that you would have been following a law that hadn't been written yet, I'd like to think. Uh, however, <clears throat> in terms of that, you know, and especially legacy software is going to run into a lot of problems with this because depending on that ERP system, it could have been written 10 years ago. And, mo and most, like, most enterprise software I've written is not new. So I would look at those, you know, because they, again, they have to be following this stuff, especially e-commerce. I would just, and, you know, if you're doing e-commerce, implement this like it belongs to everybody, whether they're in the EU or not. Solve your problem now and going forward. Um, so for that, I would first review what you've got and be like, all right, do I need that order from four years ago? Maybe, maybe not. I believe that. Um, like at the bare minimum, I would back up everything up until the day that GDPR went into effect, which was I think May 25th. Save that somewhere. Like this was our pre-GDPR data. I don't expect it to be okay. And then see what you're tracking going forward. And then I would, again talk to those drop shippers and vendors and be like, what are you doing with this data? Because most of them are yeah, we have the address, we make the thing, we send it out. That's all we do. And most of them, that's pretty easy to follow because we have the stuff, you know. And then do they have a way for you to say, hey, delete this person out of your system? Most of them, maybe it's a manual thing right now until the software catches up. So if you don't see anything on a website or you don't see anybody helping, you can always be like, what do you, you know, email, recall, what are you doing about this? Because they very well could be like, hey, we have a plan. We're waiting for the nerds to finish writing the software. You know, that could be their answer. And that's a valid answer. Like, we're trying to get the software to catch up to, you know, because GDPR was two years in the, in the works. We didn't start carrying until like a month before. <laughs> America, baby. Um, yeah, so we didn't, you know, it was like we had two years to catch up to this, and we were just like, whatever. Um, Americans. So, yeah, it's now something that like we had a lot of time to catch up and we didn't do it. Uh, so, yeah, just kind of look at what you're doing. Audit your stuff, figure out where it is, and then, you know, just be mindful of what you're doing. Because, again, it's... A lot of that's going to be good faith stuff, where if you're like, oh, I didn't realize this was being collected, but I, you know, as opposed to, hey, I made a backdoor Trojan for all my users to, you know, scrape data. Like, again, very different goals and outcomes, but GDPR applies to both. So thank you.